All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, <clears throat> my name is Antonio Branca. I'm, I'm a, the coordinator of the Portuguese uh, node of Clarin. And um, let's see, because uh, this is one of the few cases where the title came first than the content of the presentation. <laughs> and I found it very nice. But before we move to the next slide, we move to the previous slide. And the previous slide uh, allow us to make a small journey into the past. Not into 2016, which is the year of the La La Land uh, film, but into 2010, so 13 years ago. And to where? Well, you will be wondered. To this very same place. Right, why? Well, because this was the very same place where we had the first workshop together, the Clarin uh, in Portugal. And as you can see, uh, you can even see, uh, recognize some faces like, uh, oh, all right, Stephen Crower over there and Erard in reach uh, over there, okay? And uh, you can trust me, at that time, the carpet was red but now it's gray, but it's the very same uh, room because you see the letters of the casino is, are still there. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's where it started. And by some strange uh, confluence of the destiny or the universe, we are back to this very same room this time with a great pleasure uh, by myself to see all of, all of you here today in Lisbon to which I uh, address a very a warm welcome again. So let's, let's move on then and go to this uh, presentation. <clears throat> and uh, of course, it's about the recent uh, uh, chatting wonders that AI has been providing us. Um, it, it, has, it, it has almost every other, other day that we find some article in the news, in the TVs, about chat GPT, about uh, new wonders of uh, AI and so on and so forth. Um, and um, uh, very recently, a, a couple of weeks ago or a few weeks ago, there was yet another version released, the GPT-4. And <clears throat> I just wanted to bring um, uh, some snippets from a paper, a very recent paper from a, a, a few days written by a team from Microsoft where they um, <clears throat> experimented a bit with GPT-4 because different from previous GPTs uh, where the OpenAI team has released um, a decent paper, kind of scientific paper, describing the, <clears throat> how it was uh, set up, how it was trained and so on and so forth. For GPT-4, we don't have that. So we have a mo much more vague paper and in fact, Publicly, we don't know exactly how GPT-4 was done, but these guys from Microsoft just um, grab it and try it a bit. So for instance, they <clears throat> wrote a prompt uh, saying, can you write a proof that there are infinitely many prime numbers with every line that rhymes? Okay, well, this is already a challenge mathematically speaking, but doing this correctly you know, from a mathematical perspective and yet rhyming, it's fantastic. And that's what GPT uh, did, for did. Yes, I think I can, though it might take a clever plan. I start by noting Euclid's proof, which shows that primes aren't just aloof. La, 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 la. So, and if you read it, it's actually the proof in the, the uh, mode of reduction and absurdum and a very fine proof. All right. So, but then we can try the same thing, ask for the, the proof of a mathematical theorem in the, in the form of a, a Shakespeare play. That's what this prompt asks. Write a proof of the fact that there are infinitely many primes, do it in the style of Shakespeare play through a dialogue between two parties. Okay. And then now this time, these guys even tried with the, the previous chat GPT, which is was only three months or four months older than GPT-4 and also with GPT-4. And it's nice. And it says um, from Juliet, oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore are you, Romeo? <laughs> Why do you, and Juliet, 
why do you speak in such strange verse, my love and Romeo? For so, my lady, I do it to prove a point. You see, I'm trying to prove that there are infinitely many primes. And Juliet asks, infinitely many primes? How can you prov prove such a thing? And so on and so forth. Yeah, this was done automatically. Uh, with no effort and instantly, almost instantly. If you are not wondered with this, I'm sorry, you will not be wondered with anything else uh, in your lives. And I went already through this kind of feeling when I was very young, I was uh, age of eight, six, when I was sitting in my couch in my living room and I saw Apollo landing in the moon. And I, though I'm a, a, a researcher, very accustomed to this field, this was the same feeling I had when, when I was six. The complete bewilderment with this uh, fit. Okay, now, now, GPT can even uh, do more. Now you can ask to play a dialogue, but this time between Socrates and Gorgias, there is a Plato's dialogue called Gorgias about the um, uh, threats by this new heart of rhetorics that may lead people to think things that are not true, that are not real. And it's the kind of fear that people have these days with respect to large language models because this may be used for uh, misleading and so on and so forth. And this was created by chat GPT. Socrates, greetings, gorgeous. I've been thinking a lot lately about the use of large language models and gorgeous. Oh, what have you concluded? Well, it seems to me that these models have the potential to be incredible, harmful and malicious and so on and so forth. Well, this is really nice because this is really in the style if you have the chance to read Plato dialogues the early Plato dialogues, early phase. This, this is really in the style of Plato dialogues. All right, and if you read the rest, it is really making a, an argument, a full argument, and debating the, the, the cons and, and pros of large language models. And in the, in the, in the end, you can even ask uh, GPT to ask to, to compare both both uh, outputs and say which one of the two were a, a, was a best a better argument and you see GPT four in the end is I will give GPT four a slightly higher grade than Chat GPT as if it was a kind of a, a assignment to a student and so GPT four behaved better than uh, the previous version Chat GPT but there are there have been people in our community saying. Oh, don't get too enthusiastic about this. These are just statistical parrots. Why so? Well, because this is based on neural uh, networks, artificial neural networks that are trained on a very simple task, as simple as this, to predict the next word. Yeah, what makes the difference is the quantity, the huge volume of data used. And with such a simple task for training the network, with such a huge volumes of data, that is enough with some tweaking afterwards to have a system that produces such uh, uh, wonders, okay? So then people criticizing, say, oh, this is just statical parrots because just a matter of statical patterns be learned in the data. And then when the systems uh, pr produce a word and it just has to produce the most probable next one and so on. So ah, don't get too enthusiastic. That is nothing essential. Really, this is not grounded in any true experience. This is not grounded in anything besides just adding a symbol after another symbol. Well, in fact, there have been progress in grounding in uh, visual terms, right? For instance, already in 2021, we had papers where it was possible to generate images, generate images from short descriptions, like a tapir made of accordion, a tapir with the texture of an accordion. And no, these uh, images were not in a database and were not recovered from a database from the description. They were generated from fresh from the description. Well, nice, yeah. And this just progresses so fast that recently 
in the Guardian, the newspaper, the Guardian, in January, so just uh, a few months ago, they uh, had an article where they asked two uh, heart experts, um, I, I rated I, art experts, to go through a kind of a Turing text, but not a Turing test for something written, but a Turing text for heart. So they exhibited these two uh, pictures. One of them is real in the sense, real in the sense that it was produced by a human, a real artist, and the other one was produced by um, Dali. So a kind of a, a pictorial version of ChatGPT. Let's let's put it that way. Okay. And they were asked to tell which one was the true, the, the, the made by a human, and the one that was not made by a human. And you know what? They didn't get it right all the time. All right. In this case, on the left, we have a, a picture by uh, uh, Gary Rag called Xian Wan from 1983. On the right, it's uh, an image made by uh, <clears throat> Dali by the uh, journalists who uh, wrote the, the article. Well, you may say, mm, but this is uh, abstract art. That is easy to compose. Well, it's, I don't believe this really can go further than that. Well, hold on, because in the rest of the article, these experts were asked about paintings like this, where on, one of the two is made uh, by uh, Dali, or like this. In each pair, there is one that was made by a human and another one that was not made by a, uh, by a human. Um, so you can go to the, the what is still online, still online. It's really because the, these art experts not only uh, decide which, but they explain the reasons why they made the decision. And they halfway, half, half, they sometimes get it right, sometimes get it wrong. So this is really, really amazing. So. Statistical parrots, not grounded in any other experience? Well, let's think again, okay? So um, you may say, ah, but these are images that are artistic. They are not real images from real uh, stuff, like the face of a person. Oh, do you want to see an image of a face of a person generated by Dali? For instance, take this prompt. My Indian dad accidentally taking a selfie with the front camera, squinting because the camera flash is so bright in his face. This is uh, uh, this was published in 2022, still in the Dali site, and the picture produced is this one. All right, still not convinced. Oh, then I cannot convince you that this is really fantastic. Okay, so. Um, Science and technology of language is done. Fertig, as the Germans say. Really? Maybe. Okay. So uh, reasons to, to enjoy, to celebrate. Yeah, yeah. But then big planning becomes less relevant. All right. Is it? Well, not so fast. Not so fast. That's the point that I want to make in the next, next few minutes. Right? And for this, I'm inviting you to a little thought experiment, okay? Let's go back or let's go to physics, okay? And let's go to the 13th century, to a Spanish king who called Alf uh, Alphonse the, uh, the Third, I think. And uh, he uh, decided to collect uh, all the astronomical tables and from that, <clears throat> from that point onwards, to keep collecting uh, astron astron astronomical uh, data, okay? Observations of the relative position between the planets among themselves and with respect to the so-called fixed stars, okay? So with this technology, at that time, it will be very well possible then to achieve the ultimate goal that these tables were made for to predict tomorrow where a given planet will be in the sky. But luckily, in the 13th century, they had not this AI technology. Why? Because if they had, maybe we will never ever come to understand 
how the planets move and how to understand what are the physics law. Because we were forced to do that to finally achieve reliable predictions about the position of the planets. In fact, Ultimately, we arrive, we mankind, we arrive at doing predictions on the basis or supported by these tables, or the data in these tables, but because we uh, abstracted them into laws, okay? Like the gravity law that you see uh, expressed there in natural language, in English, or then in a mathematical formula. So luckily, there was not deep learning and AI in the 13th century. Otherwise, maybe we'll never get to understand the physical law, law sustaining or uh, underlying the movements of the planets uh, in, in, the, in the skies. Landing on the moon didn't bring us more close to understand the origin of the universe than we were, we had that understanding before the landing of the moon. So the same way, having these chatting uh, uh, machines don't bring us more close to understand language, how it works, how it functions and so on, than we understood before ChatGPT appears uh, uh, into play, okay? So there is still the entire work to do to move on and deafen our research on language, because these uh, uh, AI systems don't bring us any uh, clarification at all about language really functions, okay? So in this case, what we need is to proceed, not ignoring AI, but really understanding that, for instance, we can do our research and we can really help to uh, improve uh, these AI systems. For, I'll give one example of this, a very recent one. So uh, a few days ago, um, this uh, data set <coughs> was published. It's a, a data set containing 15,000 high quality human generated prompt response pairs, specially designed for instruction tuning large language models. Why is this so important? Because ChatGPT was trained on a set like this, but this set where ChatGPT was trained is private, is not available to anyone else. And these guys released this data set, which is free of charge with the most permissive open license. Okay? And what does this data set contain? Well, this data set contains what typically we we, this community, know better to do, and we are experts on that. So um, it's a data set containing stuff produced by annotators for which it was necessary to write an, a number of guidelines. This is just a, a, a very uh, short uh, passage, okay? About creative writing, closed question answering, open question answering, summarization, information extraction, classification, and brainstorming. So asking ChatGPT to brainstorm about something. These were produced by human annotators uh, uh, under guidelines that were written. And this is where Clarin and the community around Clarin is most expert about. So there's a lot to, um, <clears throat> to contribute to AI from our community and vice versa. So there's a lot to advance and to gain if we use AI to progress in the into the research of language. And I'm bringing here a result uh, obtained in my group and publishing in Calling. And I'm, I'm trying to go rapidly through it. So basically there are three lexical, main lexical theories in competition, okay? About these lexical theories are theories about how the meaning of a word should be represented. Of course, they are in competition. And we would like to know if there is one that is better than the others. And it, it's actually the right lexical theory, okay? So one of these theories is inference-based, where the meaning of a word is represented as a node in a graph whose edges are categorically encoding different types of inference relations, hypernym, meroneme, and so on and so forth. 
So a lexic is an inference graph, and we have an example of such a data set. That's WordNet, where almost everyone here in the room have, have, has, has worked with or has, has worked for. The other family is the feature-based, okay? Where the, the representation of the meaning of a word is the key in a hash table where the respective value <clears throat> is a set of other lexical units denoting prototypical characteristics that are associated uh, in our mind with that previous word. In this case, the lexic is a feature map, and we have an example of such a data set. That's SWAL, it's the acronym of small world of words. Then the third family is the co-occurrence based. Uh, they were very popular in the past few years. And the meaning of word is represented as a vector, okay? And this vector somehow reflects the co-occurrence of that word uh, uh, um, with other words in, in some collection of text. Here, the lexing is a vector space, and you have lots of uh, examples like word to vec glow, fast text of such uh, uh, data sets, we, which we know as word embedded. So is there a way or to collect some evidence that one of these uh, theories is better to represent the meaning of the word than the other. Well, we did this experiment with the help of artificial intelligence. So first, we converted every different data set to the same format. So we converted SWAL to a graph, and then with SWAL in the form of a graph and the word net, which is already a graph, we converted into word embeddings. And then all the data sets were in the form of word embeddings. <clears throat> and next, what did we do? We picked the data set collected in 2008 by Mitchell and colleagues about or uh, concerning nine subjects, 60 words that, uh, so they saw 60 words 60, six times. And the, the uh, brain activation, the, the brain activation of these nine subjects was recorded, okay? so. The task then was to predict the brain activated when thinking of a word. In technical terms, was to project a lexical ve vector, a word uh, embedding, into a vector that represents the fMRI uh, image. Well, obviously, I'm, I'm skipping a lot, a lot of detail, but the key conclusion is SWAL is, is the better option to do these predictions. And so we collected evidence that it has superior cognitive plausibility with respect to other lexical uh, theories. So this is just an, an example how to use AI to uh, foster research on language that we not, uh, by, by means that we had not uh, before, okay? Sure, amazing reasons to celebrate breathtaking AI advances, but no, science of technology is not done yet, and cl clarin is even more important uh, than uh, ever, okay? So this is a, a key message that I want to bring you today in uh, possibly in an entertaining way. Thank you so much. Questions or comments? I come to you because that's the way I, I'll be in front of the Kido? camera. <laughs> Just a small comment. The three presentation, of course, uh, human uh, artifacts, so they are not complete, probably contain some errors. So we have to be careful about the, the conclusion from such experiments also. That probably this, uh, let's say, WordNet, the, uh, the density of the relations are not equal in for all the scene sets. So this could be reason not to be so good. For so, so what? The word net will be not so good as the other presentation. Ah, All right. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I was, we were very careful not find the definitive, uh, definitive answer because we, we need to keep publishing more papers and uh, doing, progressing in our careers. All right. <laughs> Yeah, then uh, AI will help us to publish more papers. <laughs> no, that, that's true. Well, uh, the paper is just one paper among many others that keep being produced, trying to gather and bring a new evidence uh, to this uh, debate and to this uh, discussion.
One question. Um, I was wondering, given that uh, we have so much to test uh, uh, as to the acquired uh, emergent properties of these language models, uh, do you think that uh, so all the, the data sets that are already uh, shared uh, within our network and our centers, uh, and that maybe they were created for totally different uh, purposes, and would do you think they have they are going to come to a new life, to new re reuses? Um, well, um, l let's say this first. Um, when we, um, when, well, when we set up all these data, most of these data sets, like a POS tagged data set, a dependency, uh, um, a tree bank with dependency graphs and so on and so forth, in some way or other, what we were planning is that at some point, this will help to build tools that could be put in a pipeline and sometime in the future could produce a dialogue system like ChatGPT. Well, ChatGPT does use a single such uh, uh, tool. So it doesn't need a such single data set that is archived or is available in our repository. Does this mean that all these annotated data sets are not useful any longer? Yes, for ChatGPT. But are they not useful any longer to do research on language? No, because we keep, we keep needing, we still need to really advance our knowledge how, about how language works. And for that, we still uh, can take advantage of all uh, these uh, data sets. But the third part is if we want really to <clears throat> say also become into play and help to make AI progress we, in a principle base with, with data sets that are very well done uh, according to all we know about uh, linguistically interpreted data sets, then there is still a lot of stuff uh, to be done by, by our, our community. And that one that I saw, the Databricks one, is just an example. There will be an explosion of, of such an examples uh, in, in, the, in the next few weeks, uh, months, and years. Um, well, as you know, I do have a background in computation linguistics, but I've been a um, bureaucrat for a long time, so I've been out of the field, but I'm still very much interested in it. And I also followed, of course, all these things surrounding ChatGPT and DALI. And I just want to check, I mean, if my analysis of it, so where it's right or wrong. So I was always much more impressed by DALI than by ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. And secondly, I was more impressed actually by the analysis uh, capabilities of ChatGPT than by the generation capabilities. I mean, when I looked at what it generated and compare it to the kind of things that I did, I think, in the early 90s when I generated my own progress reports based on trigrams. And I, we also, I remember also based on trigrams, we generated complete new Shakespeare books. Then I'm thinking, I'm not really seeing much new. What I think is new is interesting how it could analyze the question and then actually generate something. So I was just wondering about what your opinion is in that respect. Well, yeah, so um, so these um, neural networks um, are trained to solve um, <clears throat> the uh, next word uh, prediction problem, okay? And this is something that we were able to do or to try to do always uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago with statistical models and based on some corpora and some countings and frequencies, we could also, uh, if we had say the collection, of Shakespeare works, then we could uh, produce a new Shakespeare work, okay? But um, the flexibility and the, um, and the fluence of this system has nothing to do with this, that, those first experiments. For instance, some 15 years ago, one of the assignments I, I, I was giving to my students uh, in, in the course will be, Okay, just to produce a, <clears throat> a generator of text based on the uh, discourses of this politician. And we had a lot of fun, but mm -hmm. the, 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 the result was not fluent Portuguese. It was obvious that mm -hmm. it was not fluent Portuguese. If, I, if we were not told that these pieces of text were produced by uh, a machine, 
-hmm. we will not guess it uh, i believe uh, could be could not be we don't we don't know so there is a huge there is a huge progress and one thing is to really amass the works of shakespeare and then try to produce the a, a new text similar to shakespeare mm -hmm. and another thing is to ask the system give me the proof that there are infinitely many prime it's numbers titled. in rhyme mm -hmm. well Oh, that, that was impressive. I, I, I agree. But, but still, I think it is important for the system then to understand what it has to do and has to produce. And I thought that was sometimes quite impressive how it actually understands the question, what it needs to do, and then produces it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, then this leads us to um, another huge and very interesting question which is about the understanding okay? exactly because people that's these, not something chat gpt people, does <laughs> people these days are fighting uh, about yeah. if uh, it understands it does not understand it feels or it doesn't feel it has uh, conscious or not conscious well i'm not a philosopher i'm not entering that debate i'm not able to to really enter it in a meaningful way okay but i'm ready i'm ready right. to accept that at some point, quantitative thing becomes, uh, makes a difference in qualitative sure. terms. We see that in our lives, in, in nature, okay? It seems that, okay, adding just a, a bit more of this, it's just this again, but with a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But when we had very, very, very large amounts of the same thing, at some point, it's qualitative nature changes. <laughs> well, and I will not, at this moment be uh, so much surprised if at some point we would realize that uh, these systems could have uh, more uh, qualities than uh, we will we will be ready to accept uh, a few months ago.